the Mary Porter Cessna Art Gallery at UC Santa Cruz. And thank you all uh, for joining us today for, um, for our Cessna Speak Up, Chicanx Visual Aesthetics with Amy Diaz Infante and Angelica Muro. The Cessna Speak Up series aims to provide a safe space for students and the UCSC community and surrounding communities to engage with ideas generated from our programmed exhibitions. So this event is scheduled in conjunction with the virtual exhibition, which I'm sitting in right now, of the Eduardo Carrillo Comunidad de Califas. Our exhibition, along with tonight's event, is part of the larger Califas Legacy Project, a multi-venue collaboration celebrating and documenting the legacy of our region's Chicano, Chicana uh, cultural treasures. And this event will be recorded. Uh, our Califas Legacy Project partners are the Museo Eduardo Carrillo, the Monterey Museum of Art, the Santa Cruz Art League, Moving Parts Press, the UC Santa Cruz Special Collections and Archives, the UC Santa Cruz Institute of the Arts and Sciences, Santa Cruz Public Libraries, and Watsonville Public Libraries. So it's really a broad range and we thank all of our collaborators. We also thank the UCSC, um, UC Santa Cruz Arts Division for their continued support and sponsorship of all of, the, um, of all of our projects and of our Cessna donors who make this program uh, possible. So in January uh, of 2021, just a month ago, we heard Angelica Muro and uh, Amy Diaz Infante speak at the Monterey Museum of Art Symposium called Art of the State with a fantastic subtitle, Change Equals Action Slash Time, Generational Activisms in Chicanx and Latinx Art. And it was a full day. A full day wasn't enough to get through all the dynamic topics. So we decided to have this um, event today to kind of continue all of the um, um, things we started talking about. Uh, also, during the launch of our virtual exhibition of Eduardo Carrillo, Comunidad de Califas, we featured the 1982 conference organized by Eduardo Carrillo and others called Califas, Chicano Art, Art and Culture in California. And this was a groundbreaking uh, conference and a legacy that we will continue on the Central Coast um, with programming like this. So once again, thank you. And now back to Louise. Thank you, Shelby. Uh, tonight, we continue conversations about cultural legacy, but focus on the present and future to challenge the notion of a monolithic experience and visual represent representation of and by artists who have inherited the Chicano movement. We will have two brief presentations from our artists, panel conversation, and time at the end to take audience questions and comments. The chat is open throughout the event for, um, for your questions and your comments. Our guests, uh, Amy Diaz Infante and Angelica Muro, will share their approach to exploring the tension between the weight of cultural legacy and the complexity and full expression of self in the present and future. What does a post-Chicano visual art language look like and what do we call it? You may have noticed that the term Chicanx in our event title is in quotations. This was a slight reference to an, att um, in an attempt to reflect the shifting nomenclature of Latin American identity and reflect on whether these terms always mean the same thing. And this has come out of our wonderful planning sessions with both Amy and Angelica to have these kind of discussions. Uh, Amy Diaz Infante is a visual artist living and working in San Francisco. She's a full-time faculty member in printmaking, drawing, and design at the City College of San Francisco. She holds a BA in art from Yale University, an MFA from the Rhode Island School of Design, and a collegiate teaching certificate from Brown University. She has exhibited nationally and within Mexico and is an alumna of the Giraffe Resident Artist Program. Community engagement has been a key component of her arts practice. And as an educator and administrator, she has been active in the fields of youth arts and youth leadership development. Welcome. Angelica Moro holds an MFA degree from Mills College and a BA in photography from San Francisco State University. Moro is principal and co-founder of Public Space Chinatown, director of the Visual and Public Art Gallery at CSU Monterey Bay, and Chair and Associate Professor of Integrated Media and Photography in the Visual and Public Art Department. She teaches photography, media analysis courses, and community-engaged practices. Her curatorial projects include Public Space, Space 47 Projects, Shafismo, 
New Forms of Art post Guachismo, and Yo Soy Chinatown, I Am Chinatown, Cultural Revitalization and Urban Public Space. So welcome to you both. And I'll turn it over to Amy first to give her presentation. Sure. Well, thank you, um, Louise and Shelby, for having us. Um, and I'm really excited to be here in conversation with Angelica um, to share our work. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. So I'm going to show you all. Um, it's going to be going to be a broad range of work um, from across the years. Can you see this, Louise? Great. Um, so a lot of my work um, kind of goes back to this tension that we have. A lot of it has to do with the space of the home or the space of the family um, and this tension between comfort and discomfort, um, pain and, and control, um, and this also need to be free of that control. Um, and, and in particular images like this, you know, they also speak to a particular control of, of the female body, um, of the need also for presentability um, and those kind of politics. Um, and, and this is, you know, a lot of these things come from my personal memories. And I, I didn't, you know, as a young kid, I didn't think of my hair being particularly like untamed, but I, I remember references to that and this need to like, have your hair pulled really tight and every little hair in perfect position. Um, I remember one of my grandmothers also would always use the rubber bands off of like the newspapers, you know, to save rubber bands or off of the produce. I was like, please, can I, we just invest in a rubber band that's not going to break in my hair and tear it all out. Um, but this kind of pain also um, for me connects to, you know, also the kind of love that the love that this is ways that I was taken care of, but there is this need, I think for a lot of us to have that love expressed or to ingrain in us this need to kind of have an armor that presentability or a kind of toughness um, um, that you need to operate in the world. Um, and also for me, it, it connects to a kind of dark humor like I sometimes create or see images I think it was very funny and only upon reflecting on it later you know, people will say well, it was kind of also sad, you know, um, but I think that dark humor connects also, for me, connects culturally, you know, we have things like Dia de los Muertos, like we're very open about talking about, about death, about our bodies, you know, we have nicknames and apodos that are very much like that. If you're skinny, then your nickname is flaca. It's like no big deal. It's not a good or a bad thing. It just is. Um, so those are, I think, things that seep through in my images. And going back to this, uh, again, the, the pain aspect, um, this is a book box that I created um, and it is a collection of stories. And it's also a course about, uh, about space and moving through space. So it's a book that opens from any angle um, and they open up like walls and there's little windows. And on the outside, we have words that um, connect to these stories of, of punishments and the book is called Castigos. So like on, the, on this image, you see on the outside, the word apa um, or dad and perdonar to forgive. And all the images inside come from stories that, not just my own, but uh, that I collected from people of, of the kind of punishments that they endured. And some of the objects might have a more immediate resonance for people. You know, if you see a belt or a chancla, a lot of people might have, uh, you know, or a big wooden spoon, you might have uh, a connection to that. Um, but it was interesting because there's also these other stories that have very particular um, aspects to them. Um, so for example, one of my theas talked about one of their punishments as kids if she fought with her siblings was to sit with each other on the couch and they'd had to sit side by side so that their skin was touching. And if it was really bad, a level up for that would be to salt each other, put salt on each other and lick, lick it off each other's arms. And that was to reinforce that this body is your body, your, your sibling is you, this blood is your blood. And I, I really um, had that reinforced when I was young as well, that, you know, friends come and go, but there's a, a responsibility um, towards family. And there's, you know, there's, there's a blurring of the line between the individual and the collective. Um, so along with that, um, an image like this to me speaks to that weight of inheritance. These are uh, necklaces or beads that my grandmother has on her dressing room table that she always talks about giving to us when she's gone. 
Um, and to me, that also speaks to the weight of everything that she's leading to us and everything that she's gone through so that we can be where we are. And I think for a lot of um, us who are maybe first generation college students or who come from backgrounds where their parents or grandparents immigrated here, there's a lot of that weight that um, is often felt about the need to manifest that sacrifice into some kind of something we can show that's a progress. Um, so along with that, there's also images that I'm drawn to that are about these quiet spaces. Um, there's a lot of this aspect of liminality that comes through that I think a lot of other Chicano uh, artists um, have um, come up in their work about neither being here nor there, about again, that tension. So for me, something like um, bars on the windows speak first to the kind of beauty that is made out of that need. Um, so that it can, of course, speaks to this need for protection or a kind of danger, but there's also something that is transformed to make it something um, beautiful. Um, and again, with that liminal space, this is actually a piece that's in the Monterey Museum right now. So this is a door um, that's an ink wash on fabric and it hangs about an inch off the wall. So this kind of ghost door to me speaks at liminal space as well, where it is um, a door that is obviously a metaphor for a way to pass through to another space, but at the same time, you know, there's no doorknob. It's also kind of a wall or a sentinel that kind of pushes you away as much as it um, beckons you to move through. Um, this for me, again, comes back to that kind of humor and also um, this religious aspect of growing up um, in a very heavily Catholic um, tradition. And there are a lot of things that I um, really um, don't engage with or don't connect with in terms of Catholicism, but there's so much that's integrated culturally and even the stories that we tell. So, you know, coming up with stories of like seeing La Virgen appear in your toast or your tortilla, right? So this is an apparition of my sister as a wrinkle. Um, so this kind of ghostly apparition speaks to the kind of surrealism um, and these stories that we tell. Um, and along with that, <laughs> that uh, religious side, um, you know, those of you who have gone through um, your first communion, a lot of times in middle school, you have, you get these scapulars where you wear them, where you have the vid hand, you know, on your back, like watching your back, and then you have a saint in the front. So I did a series of scapulars where um, I just had friends of mine, individuals um, with their names printed and where they were from. Um, and then I've also uh, exhibited this piece where I've had kind of blanks on front, people could draw in their own saints. And that was speaking again to the need of, um, I think culturally sometimes we feel like we have to be and look and sound a certain way because it connects to a tradition. But we want to, we sh need to remember that culture is always and needs to shift with us and needs to adapt with us to serve us in our contemporary times. And we are the culture makers and changers. So for me, this is um, speaking to that, that we can also um, religion being an aspect of that culture that you can also um, shift that, you know, you can create your own saints, you can create your own gods that you need um, that serve you now. Um, this, um, you know, I have a memory of my grandmother having these um, plates and, and there were all the decorations that had these kind of Victorian or Edwardian images and they were very fanciful and there are these like fancy plates um, and there were, you know, of these white characters and, and, their, and their powdered wigs. So I created a series of fancy paper plates. So these are screen printed with um, images of my life um, and some gold drawing around to add a little fancy elements. Um, this image, you know, a lot of my influence comes um, not only from other visual artists, but a lot from uh, writers and poets. Um, in this piece, I was also thinking about Shereen Moraga's play, New Fire. And in that play, she talks about um, uh, the uh, trauma that we inherit through our DNA. Um, and and it's, a, it's a real thing. You know, there's been scientific studies around trauma that passes down generation to generation. Um, so these flowers that are in here, in here, the passion flower and the skull caps, they're actually plants that are indigenous to the Americas, but they've been renamed after the conquistadores coming here, the skull caps, like the caps that the conquistadores wore, the passion flower to have a religious connection to Jesus. Um, and they're 
At the same time, they actually are, are plants that are used to treat anxiety and depression. So to me, this is a reminder that we carry that trauma, but we also carry within us the medicine. Um, and to me, this is, I mean, another kind of religious connection, but really it's again, a connection to, to family. So, um, you know, anytime you are not feeling well, you have a job interview coming up, you know, my grandma says, you know, okay, the way for the end of the I'm going to turn the candle on for you. And she does her prayers. And that to me is like the most powerful thing. So, um, this is a connection to that. And a lot of things that come up in my work imagery as well is is the lace and patterning things like this that remind me of of the home space and particularly of of work that is associated with women's work and um, how to mark time and another thing that you know you look back at your 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 work i notice that i tend to have a lot of hands come in and i think part of that actually is a, is a connection maybe subconsciously to an identity that is so much wrapped in what we do and what we can make and create um, and so I, I find that sometimes I'm creating images that are hands versus faces. Um, so sometimes I want to kind of get back to that and something as simple as having our faces and our images put out there is really important to me. So this is another portrait of another sister, uh, Alicia with a quote um, above um, from her. So to me, it's also important to engage with others in art making. And a lot of my background has been also in youth development or in youth arts nonprofits. Um, so I think it's important that we are um, thinking of, of art making also as community building. So um, I will leave it there. And I will stop share. Thank you, Amy. So next we'll hear from Angelica and I'll be sharing her media. All right, so hello everyone. Uh, so as uh, was stated in, in my introduction and in the uh, uh, press leading up to this uh, event, uh, my name is um, Angelica or Angelica, depending on how people read me. Uh, I'm a child of the 80s, a time of profound assimilation, uh, philosophically and otherwise. Uh, which, you know, facilitated, um, I think, innate cultural criticism within me, even as a child. My formative years as an artist were in the 90s, a, a time of deep identity politics, and uh, the early uh, to mid-aughts, um, which were a time of experimentation when artists, I saw artists really taking their careers and exhibition opportunities into their own hands by curating exhibits, creating their own projects, um, and even um, building out their own art galleries. So this was the first time that I felt that I could be an artist, a scholar, a social practitioner. Uh, it was also a time when grassroots was pushed to the next level. And as a first generation um, Latina, this allowed me to really question and experiment um, with how I wanted to engage in the arts. And so in the end, I would say that I'm now an artist, a scholar, an educator, um, and a cultural critic. So for this presentation, I've chosen the following body of work because it, um, it's been circulating for the past year. Obviously, I've, I've been doing this for a while, so I have a, a thankfully a vast body of work. But during the past year, um, these four bodies have, have been um, circulating. And I think really it's because we've obviously, I don't have to, I don't have to uh, you know, say this, but I will, it's, it's been a year of, of profound social and racial reckoning. Um, and a time when being a female, being Latina, and um, being an artist has taken on a uh, new meaning. Uh, generally and you know, just also for myself. So for the most part in my work, I use irony to explore class and cultural identity. I seek to merge provocative and destabilizing elements to facilitate a dialogue about the social, cultural, and political issues that define and shape our consumer identity. Um, my work examines and explores the tension between race, class, and gender, and the complexities of diasporic culture and the realities of immigrant life in contemporary uh, American culture and life. So we can go to the next slide. So I'm gonna start here with this series um, called Narco Language. And so in this series, I examine the profound uh, proliferation of drug culture in relation to cultural identity, uh, media images, pop culture. Uh, and so we can go to the next slide. 
you know, the term narco has become an aestheticized prefix that's widespread in media and visual culture. It's a term that is evolved into a kind of offhand jargon that anesthetizes escalating violence through repetition. And I was really interested in examining that. For example, narco fosas are pits where cartels um, dump victims. Narco mantas are banners strung by gangs from highway overpasses with threatening messages. Narco chic refers to a lifestyle of AK-47 rifles, flashy cars, status symbols, um, such as ostrich leather boots or rhinestones or gold pendants. Um, narco queens are beauty pageant contestants who become involved with the drug lords or, or more specifically Sinaloense beauty queens who are drawn into the Sinaloa drug trade. Um, the photographs in this series are part of a larger body of work to present the term narco as untidily scattered, uh, sprinkled, spread, and tossed through everyday life and language, both eluding and amplifying the visual culture of drug cartels and drug violence, um, which have become so normalized that we often read these images as both uh, glamorous and gruesome. Next slide. All right, so a, a extreme pivot here. And so what you're looking at here is um, uh, a guide from the Environmental Protection Agency, um, the EPA. Um, this is a guide that was uh, uh, created in 1992, but to this day, if you go to the Environmental Protection um, Agency, I just went to it yesterday, is the pamphlet that is given to um, farm workers advising them um, about pesticides, in this case, in particular, agricultural workers. And it's both in English and in Spanish, you can see there, it's uh, protect yourself from pesticides um, and then protejate uh, de, de, las, de los pesticidas. Um, and next slide. And so I um, grew up in a migrant labor camp in the middle of the California San Joaquin Valley. Um, and for those of you that don't know about the San Joaquin um, Valley, it's, it's incredibly diverse um, in, its, in its production of produce. It's a valley known as the food basket of the world. Um, and it's the highest producer of agriculture in the US. And in spite of this, it has immense, uh, in spite of this immense, um, agricultural productivity, this area is home to the state's highest rate of food insecurity. And it has the highest percentage of residents living in federal poverty, meaning that six um, of the counties in, um, in the San Joaquin Valley um, are below the federal poverty line. Um, my father worked in these agricultural fields for over 30 years. I, like I said, was raised on a migrant camp. And it was during a, a home visit when I was in graduate school, I went to Mills College, um, that I first saw the EPA pamphlet sitting on my, on, um, my family kitchen table. Um, it had been issued to my father as part of a training module for the Environmental Protection Agency as a guide to protect himself from pesticides. Again, written in Spanish, um, the pamphlet used cartoon figures pandering to shockingly common stereotypes. You can go to the next slide, as well as overly simplistic language. And I found it shockingly patronizing towards farm, farm workers who ironically have um, a, a profound sense of of, or, you know, or understanding of the tragic effects that pesticides wreak on their community. And so, you know, as an educational tool, um, it perpetuated the lowest common denominator of what one thought when they thought agricultural worker. So initially, next slide, initially I began making reproductions of these drawings um, to place the illustrations in a different context. And so I was just making these eight by 10 hand drawings where I was taking um, the, the, um, the images that were in the pamphlet, next slide. And these are images from the actual pamphlet that you just saw before. And these are images that I'm now drawing. And so I'm just, I'm just drawing them with pencil. And previous to this, I think it's important to note that I was, I was very much staunchly a photographer and it wasn't until I got to graduate school that I actually started to really engage in drawing. Obviously, I'd taken drawing classes and, and had a foundation in it, but it wasn't the, the type of art that I was making. And so when I started to, uh, you know, recreate these drawings, just to put them in a different context, um, I felt that the drawings were a reflection of, of my own marginalized identity um, of subjugation. And my intention was to engage the viewer in a critical ethical inquiry um, that maybe forced us to contemplate the pamphlet's designers belittling and presumptuous image and text choices. So in the end, next slide. In the end, I, I, I complicated these images. Next slide. Um, so these are just, um, again, images of, of the drawings. 
Next slide. Next slide. So in the end, I, I complicated these images more by juxtaposing um, elements of social economic class and cultural symbols that reflected um, our consumers' values and our beliefs, such as goods that have reached iconographic status, um, such as a, a Prada handbag or Gucci shoes or Dior logo. And I did this in order to emphasize the absurdity of not only an accessory or an insignia elevating a person's social standing, but all at once thinking about not only the pamphlet, but, but you know, what we were talking about here in terms of the have versus the have nots, that these act all at once as spectacle, artifice, cultural marker, but they also serve to highlight the profound equity gaps, um, the systemic social issues and the social cultural divide that relegates dangerous, low wage essential work and the people who carry out that work to the margins of our society. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so again, we'll, we'll pivot. <laughs> uh, you can see here the, the spectrum that I'm working on. So this is a body of work called Club Lido's Wild Eyes and Occasional Dreams. And it's a body of work that initially, um, or was initiated by um, Intersection for the Arts in San Francisco, um, where the curator was putting a show um, together called Chico and Chang. Um, and it was about the intersection between Latino and Asian cultures. And he had found out that I was working on a series of images um, about a club uh, called uh, Club Lido, which was at that time um, uh, sort of a staple in downtown San Jose. Um, it no longer exists there. It's, it's been gone for about two or three years. Um, but it's, um, it was a club where Vietnamese and Mexican subcultures in San Jose were able to coexist. Um, and it was literally a Vietnamese dance club upstairs and a Mexican cantina downstairs. And so these, this is a place where you would go and you would literally have these, these two subcultures in San Jose, which were um, very much part of the identity of San Jose, but that didn't necessarily um, come together or coexist in any sort of meaningful way. Um, and in this space, um, uh, sort of anything went. And it was fascinating to me um, to see the, the similarities between these two cultures in this space. And so through this work, next slide, the work um, was initially a book. And so this is, this is the cover of that initial book. Next slide. And here you have um, the book, which had a musical component. And so it had music, I had banda music and um, Vietnamese music and uh, karaoke music, and then a mix of the two. And so it had the musical component, the, the large format book, and then the um, neon that you're seeing there is uh, a replica, uh, replica of the neon sign that you would see when you were at, in the, at, on the front of, um, of Club Lido. Um, and it was, it, you didn't really know what was inside. And that was the beauty of Club Lido is it, it didn't have any real identifying markers of what you were going to get when you when you entered and all you saw on the front there was this um this large um circle next slide and so I, you know, with this work, I was, um, you know, interested in exploring the, the interwoman and sometimes incongruous cultures of, of two of California's largest populations, and that is the Latino and the Asian communities. Um, through irreverent, humorous, um, and oftentimes, I would say, inspiring candor um, by posing complex questions about the assumptions and construction of these cultures. Um, and then, you know, finding out how it is, you know, where the boundaries are and where these two cultures begin to intersect and sometimes collide. Next slide. So in the end, the project examines the impact of Asian and Latino cultures. Um, and it's also, um, it's, a, it's about the cult of personality and pop culture and fictitious characters and subcultures and urban myths and legends. But it was also very much a, a place that, um, that teetered on, on that balance of the cultural similarities between these two groups. Next slide. Next slide. Next. And Club Lido also had a, um, a, a large transgender community and following. 
Um, and it also had like a goth night. And so it was, it was truly um, integrated. Um, and it was a space for everyone. Next slide. Next slide. And these were um, all these images here were were uh, were based on real people that I would come in contact with at Club Lido. Next slide. And then this ended up again. It started as a book, and then it culminated into an exhibition. And this this actually this work was was has been widely seen. It, it was also at the Riverside Museum. Um, it was at uh, San Jose Institute of Contemporary Art, among other places. Next slide. Next slide. All right, so the final uh, body of work that I'll, I'm gonna talk about is a, a body of work called Packing Heat. Um, and this um, uh, is a, next slide. So Packing Heat is a response to female representations in the media and specifically representations of the femme fatale in Mexican cinema and how these images play into postmodern notions of gender identity and feminist theory. Um, and all this was done as part of a residency at Slanguage Studio in Wilmington, California. Next slide. Uh, so the work uses a, uh, what I would call a postmodern approach to examine notions of racial marginalization, patriarchal mores, and representations of women in the media. Uh, it demonstrates a skewed post-feminist perception um, that hotness equals empowerment. Next slide. And it's both reminiscent of film noir and 80s glam. Um, I think that they're, they're evocative and they're purposely hypersexualized to ignite a discussion about our romantic perception of gender empowerment, violence and equalization. In the end, um, Packing Heat was a multimedia installation inspired by the female representations of Mexican cinema, but it was comprised of, of uh, integrated media, meaning photography, drawing, sculptural elements that reference the female action heroine uh, and uh, femme fatale. And again, it was openly playing on this new math of post-feminism, which is hotness essentially equals empowerment. Um, so these images were meant to evoke a certain cinematic expression and allegory that implied a culture of fear while paradoxically indulging romantic notions of gender empowerment, violence, and equalization. And that's it. Thank you, Angelica. Um, and thank you, Amy, for your presentation as well. Um, maybe to start off, uh, I have this opportunity for both of you to respond to each other's work. Comment. Sure. Well, I mean, I I really want to jump in and say that it's um, I really love looking, uh, seeing all about Angelica's work and hearing her speak about it. I think it's just so salient right now in our pandemic world, um, the whole EPA series. Um, because, and, and, you know, I grew up in Salinas, you know, Hanika talked about her experience. It's very real. Like we know that there are higher rates of cancer and all these other um, health consider conditions in Salinas are other similar areas. Um, and I've seen, you see the fields being sprayed. You see an organic field, um, you know, quote unquote organic, but it's like next door to a conventional field. So like, you know, the air doesn't know where to stop, right? Um, but I just think seeing these images, it's a big reminder because we as a general population have become a little bit familiar with this kind of imagery and this kind of terminology with the like separating your clothes, the, um, of these kind of precautions that are being taken and this term about essential workers. Um, but, you know, like Angelica is showing in her series, this is not a new thing, right? For a, a lot of populations, this is essential work um, that has been carried out and not valued um, and um, not recognized and um, endangering people you know, way before the pandemic. Yeah, thank, thank you for that, Amy. Oh, sorry, there's, a, there's an echo. Uh, yeah, you know, it's really interesting because today, I wasn't planning on this, obviously, because I, I had a lot of things to do, and then we, we were going to have this talk, but there was a, a talk um, put on by Stanford. Um, one of their professors wrote a book called Salinas, Race and Resilience in an Agricultural City, and I thought, I, I really feel like I have to attend this talk. It was about two hours ago. 
And it was really interesting the way that 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 was positioned as sort of this normal, uh, like normative white hierarchy, right? And I and I thought that that is directly what it is that we're dealing with, and it really is a social, a complex social order. I mean, there's no denying it. They're they're complicated stories, but they're stories that belong to you, Amy. They're they're stories that belong to me. I mean, we we grew up with this, and we see it, and we and we see um, the way that that this type of work really ha like wreaks havoc on on um, the people who perform these jobs. And you know, there's there's no way around it, and we cannot disguise it. Um, it is an inequity issue. Um, and we need to then, I felt um, back then, and I feel now, which is why I keep coming back to the work and I think people are drawn to it, is because um, it's, it still resonates with me and we need to be telling these stories and we need to be paying attention to how it is that these workers and these essential workers are being represented. Thank you both for that. And yeah, on, on the topic of, um, you know, untold narratives and, and stories, uh, I know that, uh, Amy, you you had the response to Club Lido. Um, you had a, a, a bar in the mission that, that you were called to. So I wanted to ask you both about um, spaces like Club Lido, and I think was the club called Esta Noche, Amy, was that what it's called, as sites of untold histories. And I was even recalling our last event about murals as representing untold histories. And murals are specifically, you know, site specific, but then now we're actually talking about spaces that are invisible even. So what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, you know, like I said earlier, Toledo, I, uh, I, I, I'd be remiss if I don't mention that a major part of Club Lido is my collaboration with Juan Luna Vin. And so um, my bad for not mentioning that, because um, when I when I started to then explore it, I'd already been making work about Club Lido. But then when I started to get into the musical component of it, Juan is also an artist, but he's 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 a DJ and he's a radio host and he's so well versed in music. And that's such an important component of it but he actually texted me like two years ago he was in downtown San Jose and he said it's gone and I said what do you mean it's gone and there was something so sad about it because it, it really was an institution um, and as um, these types of spaces um, get pushed out because of gentrification um, we're losing a, a major part of our identity and our culture and where it is that people who are pushed to the margins can actually go to and be themselves. Right, and um, when Angelica was talking about Club Lido, it brought to mind this other club, Esta Noche, uh, here in San Francisco in the Mission, which is a gay Latino club, like you would go in there and it was you know, like rancheras playing, it was like you know, guys that look like your your Theo that you grew up with. Um, some people, I would be like, I don't know, I think this person has a wife and kids at home. But, you know, there are all these stories, some more hidden than others or occulted than others. And meanwhile, you know, if, if you were to go to the Castro, you know, it's, it's very segregated there. It's very white on the whole. And I remember growing, going out, you know, I was younger with my friends and they would be like, we knew the one club where they're going to play hip hop, where most of the people of color would be. And notoriously, the club next door to it was one that we, you know, everyone knew if you went there, you're going to get bad vibes. It was very, very white. You felt very unwelcome. And the owner of that club bought the club that was kind of targeted, targeting and marketed towards people of color um, to kind of like push that population out as well is what it felt like. Um, and then again, with gentrification you know, here, particularly in the mission, um, you know, Esta Noche is, is gone. So we are losing space in general, and we're losing these really special spaces that um, um, speak to these connections that are uh, these interstitches of different parts of our community. I think um, maybe it was it was Amy or, or on Helica, I don't remember, but talking about them as just the, the intersections of all these things that we're, we're talking about. So um, because our programming was related also to the, the Khalifa's Legacy Project, and we're talking about the themes that come up in Chicano art, um, you know, there are some 
cultural themes like religion and labor and domestic life that continue to be explored. Um, how have you noticed the, the methods and interpretations changing? I mean, the, the methods of, of kind of dealing with these themes? Yeah, making art about them. Like Amy, you're, you're a printmaker. And of course there's a strong printmaking tradition in, in Chicano art with political posters, but you know, that's not all it is, right? So. Right, I, I think something that um, Helica and I spoke about was that, you know, especially in the Khalifa's um, programming and exhibit and then coming out of the symposium, which is um, very pur purposefully an intergenerational um, exhibit. And we had in the symposium, a lot of um, folks of that earlier generation talking about the Chicano movement and the kind of imagery that has come out of that. And a lot of it, and it continues, but especially political posters and myself, as a printmaker, I was really entrenched in that. Uh, but as you can see, as an artist, um, that's not a lot of what I make. Um, and I, I feel like I often experience the, the uh, expectation as a Latina, as a Chicana, um, as a Chicana printmaker, that I'm, I'm going to be making big, bold political posters all the time. Um, so I think for me, it's really important um, not just for myself to be true to who I am, but also for us to all recognize that we need to be able to hold on to the complexity and nuance of our experiences and be able also to address multiple audiences. Sometimes um, political work can be geared towards a white audience, right? And we also need work that speaks to and of ourselves. Um, and we need to be able to hold all that complexity at once. Um, a big thing that came out of that symposium that we all, I think a lot of us spoke about afterwards that really needed to be addressed was this idea of in the Chicano movement, you know, this, this feeling like what is the right time? What is the time to address equity for different populations or different kind of identities, right? And that we needed to address equity um, for Latinos as a group and women within that group have to kind of wait. And that question came up in the symposium. And there's some, uh, uh, there was a response that, you know, oh, well, sexism is like, we'll figure it out. Like we need to focus on racism first. And I, I feel like we really need to talk about that because to say that, especially to say that to women of color, like we don't have the luxury of waiting, right? You can't say, I'm gonna unchain your left arm, but not your right, and you'll be free. Or that we should tell, people should tell ourselves you have to segment your identity and only parts of yourself can be addressed at one time. Um, I think it's a false narrative of, of this kind of keeps us um, fighting for scraps and saying there's not enough time, there's just not enough to go around. It's just not true. And I think we need to really be strong about that, especially as women, because I mean, and it, it goes across sectors. I think I share the story with you all, you know, when I was in grad school, my instruments would cover either one annual exam, an annual physical or a gynecological exam. And I thought, well, you know, it's so funny because my uterus is inside and part of my body. So why don't you just check this whole thing out, you know? Um, so, and, and if we're gonna talk about our particular experiences or, or us as a population, um, particularly for Mexicans, you know, we have to address that. If we are caging children at the border and women and children are in particular suffering sexual abuse, women are being sterilized without their consent, you know, where are we gonna be as a people there if we're being still today sterilized? So um, I just, I know that's like a big kind of worm. So I feel like it opened up and then we didn't get a chance to address it. So I want to bring that up now. myself. Sorry about that. Um, yes. <laughs> yes to everything that Amy just said. I, I, I echo that. And I think that, you know, again, this is, this is, this is um, vast territory that needs to be covered because there, there's so much that is, is being left unsaid. Um, you know, this is, this is obviously a class issue um, when women are, are placed into a, a category or a, a class category for sure. Um, gender matters enormously and this is about cultural inclusion and exclusion. And so much of, of, of the way that women are positioned within the, the, the Chicano framework or the Chicano arts framework is, is under, under the umbrella of domesticity. 
right? Where it is that we're, we're supposed to or having to deal with women's work. And even in, in um, shows recently within the last five years, um, people put position my work there or start to talk about um, domestic issues or family or child rearing. Um, and so they, they can't separate the two. And so for me, it's it's really important that I be making work that obviously deals with my with my female identity, obviously. Um, but for me, it's it's about uh, furthering an equity agenda always, and it's about being able to make work that that um, that allows me to explore all the different areas and all the different representations of that. Um, it's it's nuanced, and you know we were we were talking about this before, but it's 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 certainly not a monolith, um, and but we are but we're still very much um, beholden to what it is that curators want to see from us, um, and that's challenging because I can tell you that a lot of my work um, won't 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 be seen it's just simply because it's not the work that people choose when. Um, uh, you know, when they're, when they want to exhibit it, right? Like if, and so this is, this is a part of when I started my talk and I said, you know, in the, in the early um, 2000s, what I was really seeing, which it was with a real cultural shift in terms of artists and artists of color in particular, taking their careers into their own hands. And that's when you started to see them curate their own exhibits. That's when you started to see them open up their own uh, project spaces. And the only time that I've been able to really fully exhibit my entire body of work or the work that how, the, how I want other people to see it is when I've either curated a show myself um, or I've literally gone to an institution or a gallery and said, I, I want to be able to show this work. Other people just looking at my work coming across from it are always going to choose very specific work that they feel that they feel uh, fits sort of the, the archetype of, of what it is to be um, a Chicano or Latina artist um, in, in today's society. Thank you both. Um, you know, what, what you bring up, um, because we're talking about terminology and expectations, I wanted to ask, uh, your thoughts about even the term Chicanex. You know, we've heard the different iterations, Chicano, Chicana, Chicane, and, and on, but um, what are your thoughts about the shifting nomenclature of, of identifiers? It's complicated. It, it really is. I mean, there, there's still, uh, there's still much, there's so much exploration to, to still be done in that area. And I think that it's all, it's also very controversial. Right. And again, we're, we're not as a group of people, um, being a, a, a majority minority, um, we're, we're going to be um, complex and we're gonna be complex in terms of our heritage and um, our cultural identity and how it is that we want to engage. Uh, and so you're going to, especially right now, is a time where where that nomenclature is really spread out in terms of how it is that people identify. Um, so I wouldn't say for me that there's a there's a right or wrong, but there certainly are areas and areas of study where where there is a right and a wrong. Yeah. And Amy, I think you made a point about um, consolidating political power. Right. I, yeah, I think, I mean, and, and again, in the symposium, I think I remember some of the uh, um, the artists uh, that really came up in the Chicano movement generation were saying, oh, now there's this X thing going on. And, and it was, it, and it kind of said in a way we're like, I don't know if I really connect with that. And so I think this speaks to, and like I was saying that it's, it's constantly shifting. Um, and I think, you know, even within our own families, in my family, my, my mom is going to use the term Hispanic. That's what she knows. I grew up always just saying Mexican because that's what I knew. And it wasn't until actually my first year undergrad going to a Mecha meeting and everyone went around, they asked us to introduce ourselves with our name and where we're from and how we identify. And I had never even considered that. I was like, how do I identify? Because this label was just placed on me, right? And I think um, there is this want and this need to have some autonomy over what labels we have and not just have them placed on us. Um, and I mentioned before in another conversation how this comes up every census, you know, there's these different boxes. We know that race is a social construct and often for Latinos that is even more complicated and we see these boxes and we may not feel like we fit in any one of them or 
um, or some kind of strange combination of them. Um, and I think part of the push and pull is that we want to have the nuance of our stories. You know, what is the particular experience of a first generation Mexican American versus a third or being in California or a Cuban in Florida or a Puerto Rican from the Bronx? And um, so there's a need for that complexity. So we're not read as a monolith. This also came up recently when talking about the Latino vote in the last election. What does that mean? You know, can we parse that out? And but there's, it points also to this other polar need of, of to consolidate political power. So I think there's is this way that we use these kind of bigger umbrella labels so that we can consolidate political power, but also this need to not lose the complexity. So it's it's both. Um, and I think we, you may, each of us may gravitate to different labels. It may shift as you know, we go through life or different, different spaces, right? I know that in a kind of code switching way that I may identify differently or use a different term depending on the context, right? Um, so if I'm just home with my people or wherever, I'm just gonna say Mexican. But if depending on the context, you know, I may use a different term for a particular reason. Thank you both. Uh, my last question before we get to audience um, is if, you know, is there a term to describe the this interdisciplinary art being made by Latin American artists today? A big one. Um, Well, I mean, I, I curated a show with, um, with uh, one of uh, my cre uh, collaborators, um, uh, Dionisa Mendoza, um, about three years ago. And that show we titled it um, Chapismo, an exploration of post rasquachismo And so, you know, I, I use that term a lot when, when I'm describing what, where we're at aesthetically, Chapismo and post rasquachismo um, But I, I think that there's there's a lot of room right now in terms of uh, again the the nomenclature and and where it is that we go from here, um, and I think that again there, there's going to be um, lots of different experiences um, that are going to come out of this last year, and I'm actually excited and looking forward uh, to 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 see where where this can take us and how it is that um, that we we engage in this moment moving forward? Like how, how is that going to propel, propel us in terms of what is what is to come? And I would just reiterate again, the need for the complexity that we don't need to be kind of all fit under one term, right? They're gonna be different. As I was pointing out, it's gonna transform, it's gonna shift, there's gonna be multiple themes or, um, um, you know, ties that we see coming through at the same time. and. I, you know, I, I also, when I hear the term Latin American, I don't readily identify with that. And I think we have to be really careful, especially in terms of where, I think we're in a place right now where a lot of institutions are kind of being held to account and, and kind of being put on notice and, and feeling this push to diversify collections, diversify their exhibitions. And under that, there's sometimes under this kind of term of Latin American, what happens is we have a lot of, um, um, presentation of Latinos that are coming from other parts of Latin America that are not the U.S. And sometimes Latin Americans, Latinos in the U.S. are feeling like we're not being represented. That happened, that came up at El Museo del Barrio, it's come up at other museums where, um, you know, we're not seeing Puerto Ricans in New York being represented in El Museo del Barrio as much as like someone from Argentina. And not to say that that can't also happen, but we don't want to lose um, you know, representation of, of Latinos in the US, which I think is sometimes seen, you know, can be seen as lesser kind of work than um, other parts of Latin America. Thank you both. Um, now I'm going to, I'm gonna remove the spotlight so we can all be on gallery view. And I think we had a question from um, Esteban that he'd like to ask. Esteban, are you there? Yes. Hello. Um, hello. <laughs> um, thank you both for everything. This has been very, one of the better Zooms I've gone to in a while. Um, thank you very much. I'm super interested in what you're talking about. I wanted to um, 
as an artist ask questions that kind of hit hit my heart as you were speaking about it which was uh, Amy had brought up the idea of uh, the politics of presentability. And I thought about the idea was presentability versus performance and how those two things correspond with maturity for lack of a better way of saying it. Like the idea that presentability through your art, Amy is like depicted as like what your parents are kind of imposing on you. And the performance would arguably be the maturity as you age, you take on that stuff from family the things you choose and then you just do it on the world in your own account and i am interested as i am mexican and puerto rican but grew up in a, a, a spanish speaking household but don't speak spanish like assimilated all these things that get very complicated for me navigating my own identity and then in relationship to art specifically as an art world that really um promotes you having a fixed clear identity by certain institutional standards so amy the last thing you just said really resonated with me this idea of like well i've been included in several latin american shows but i'm a non-spanish speaking chicagoan who's mexican and puerto rican and grew up on hip-hop so that's where it really came to me when uh, Angelica, thank you so much. For, first of all, that club sounds amazing. I'm really sad I missed that, whatever that was. But uh, Angelica talked about like the assimilation of the 80s. And the for me, like in the deep identity politics of the 90s, I also realized for me, even that, that was my age of like the 90s was also this like hyper era of, of hip hop of hip hop and mainstream, which was this avenue for people like me who were like, oh, we're a person of color, but we don't have a place because our language has been taken away or because we wanna be hyper American. We didn't grow up like in these situations. So I, I was just rewatching um, Fresh Off the Boat, like these different characters are like, yeah, hip hop is this space, the African-American struggle, this uh, low income poverty, cultural, creative practice that came out of New York and all that, like I grew up painting graffiti. So between those two things, this idea of like my background, my culture, the assimilation I faced, but then this, this presentability idea of like, this is how you're supposed to be. And then when that becomes performance, when you get older, and then especially when it moves into the art conversation as professionals of like, well, what work should I be making to be Latino, Hispanic, Latinx enough? And how does that fit within your personal practices, curatorial practices, institutional practices? I just would love to hear you both speak on that if you could, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for all that. I feel like we could just like keep going and going. I, and I definitely connect with that. Like, just like you said, there's that kind of um, evolution of like the control that you have of your parents or your family unit of like how to be in the world, you know, um, how to navigate the world and how you need to be to get ahead. And for some, some of us, a lot of it, sometimes it is don't speak Spanish. And I grew up speaking Spanish with my grandparents, but I still remember when I was a kid in Salinas that we can get in trouble for speaking Spanish at school. And that was not that long ago. Um, so there, there's all these ways about how you're supposed to present. And I think um, in the kind of young adulthood that um, becomes subconscious and a kind of code switching that happens, um, both in language and other types of code switching, you know, also for myself being a first generation college student, going to a, a school like Yale where it felt like it was Harry Potter. I was like, this is a whole nother world. Like it just felt weird. How did I even get here? I thought, the whole time I was there, like they're gonna catch me and like be like, what are you doing here? So I think they're, and then I would come home and they'd be like, Oh, she thinks she's so fancy, you know, <laughs> like, you're like, oh, do you even like, you know, who are you? So there's, there's that kind of code switching and you kind of have to laugh it off or find a way to fit in between. And I think, as you said, through maturity, then, and it kind of starts to become more, more conscious. Sometimes you use that performance to like get ahead and just be like, this is what I'm going to do to get into this space or whatever. But I think in terms of, um, uh, particularly in the art world, I, I feel very strongly that we, again, right now where people are talking about how do we be more inclusive and talking about equity, that we really have to define that for ourselves, right? Because there's a push to, I think often, you know, an institution wants to show a diverse or audience or show a Latino audience, and they want it to look 
how they expect that to look so they can check that box, right? And then you can be like, see, like you guys, it's, they want it to be seen. I want you to show Latino artists. And I want people to know this is definitely a Latino artist because, you know, it's bright and bold and colorful or whatever I expect that to be. Um, so I think in, in, as we are making the push for institutions to um, be more inclusive of ourselves in presenting work and in, in, in bringing us in as audiences and really owning the spaces that we have to make sure that we start to you know, engage in that conversation of what that looks like and that we are the ones who define what we're gonna look like. And it's not gonna be one kind of way. Yeah, I, th I think we're we're pretty close to running out of time, but just to uh, echo what what Amy said, we need to be the ones that direct what the visual representation is, quite and simple. And you know, I talked about earlier how I, it is that I saw you know the '90s, the early '90s and mid '90s being very very formative years for myself as an artist and a scholar um, and a cultural worker. It, the way that I was seeing um, not having representation, not having other people around me who were who were Latinos making work the way that I was making it, meaning there were there were cultural groups and there were um, uh, uh, places such as Galeria La Raza or Macla, you know, just regionally. Um, but those weren't necessarily the places um, that were exhibiting the type of work that I was making. And so, um, you know, in as early as 2007, I, I curated a show called, um, it was called Feel the Difference Cultural Branding Remix. And what I did was I included artists in that show that essentially were, were deciding I, I am a mix of all of these things. I, I am a, a, a it's I, I am part of of everything that I am seeing within my within um, American culture as, as part as, as well as my cultural heritage. And it is um, it is in a way a cultural branding and it's definitely a remix, right? And uh, we we need to start creating a space um, where there where there is um, more room for that type of representation. And again, the the Chapismo show that I that I curated um, about three years ago now was uh, uh, was in direct response to that. Yeah. Thank you, Shelby. Did you you had a question? Yeah, and um, thank you. This is really, this came out of last night's um, talk on visualizing abolition too, but um, how are each of you, you know, making space for this complexity? Because you, you talked about it, the complexity, it's messy, it brings up emotions and, you know, there's recurring themes um, decade by decade. And, um, and how do you, um, yeah, I don't know if you, we, we're almost out of time, but if you have a way to just, yeah, how do you, share that complexity without having to say it's complex. I don't know, Shelby, you just, I, I, you just go day by day, really. And you just do what you do you, you do what you do and, and, it, and it's nuanced and you complicate it. And you, know, you have to be bold about it. And so I, I feel that again, this, this time, this space, this moment, has given us the opportunity to complicate things, um, and to be and to be loud about it, um, and to and to put forth um, what it is that we want to see, um, and you know we set a, a list of demands in a way that we haven't been able to do in quite some time, and so um, you know we live this every day, we breathe it. It just it is. It's just what it is. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what comes to mind for me. It's just, you just do it and you have to, you know, there are going to be moments where you question yourself or you have imposter syndrome or whatever it is. And it's just trusting yourself because it, I think as Esteban brought up before, there is this performative aspect. Some of it's conscious or unconscious or your, your, of, of what you're expected to be or how you're present, expected to present. Um, whether you're trying to get an access to a space or whether you're just trying to find a path leaves resistance to whatever that is, um, or you're trying to fit in and be accepted. So um, uh, I think it's just, it really is just like, like, like I said, day by day, you gotta trust yourself and, and just know that you know, there's nothing wrong in who you are and, and how um, in your individuality. Well, thank you everyone. Um, 
for joining us tonight. We're at the end of our program. I want everyone to give maybe like a, a virtual applause for our guests tonight, their reactions. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, what I'd like to last do is thank our Khalifa's Legacy Project collaborators, Museo Eduardo Carrillo, Monterey Museum of Art, Santa Cruz Art League, Moving Parts Press, um, and the Santa Cruz and Watsonville Public Libraries. Um, thank you again so much for joining us. Please keep in touch. If you'd like to send us a note, our email address is sesnon at ucsd.edu. Thank you both so much, Amy and Angelica. Thank you all. <laughs>